Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Today we're going to be talking about NXT from December 13th, 2022. But before we get into NXT, as promised, we're going to get into the William Regal interview on Inside the Ropes. So um, I decided uh, to just play the audio so you guys can listen to it. And uh, I won't have to actually take notes. So let's <laughs> let's do this first. Uh, then we'll get into NXT. So, I've made no bones about the fact why I'm in w, uh, AEW. Right? I was happy to take... When I got the call, in, I knew it was coming. I had a good... Well, I had a good idea. Because people were coming down to... to the, there was obviously changes going on, and I agreed with a lot of the changes because we'd pretty much peaked... I don't know if anybody will ever realize this until it's too late. I have a theory. Some people have heard this, but everything peaked at TakeOver Portland. All right, so TakeOver Portland was a pretty good show. Um, let's, let's look at the card real quick before we go too far into this. Now, NXT TakeOver Portland was in 2020. It was the last uh, big event before the pandemic, which, you know, he's about to mention now. So the card for that show, uh, for starters, Mauro Ronaldo and Nigel McGinnis and Beth Phoenix were on commentary. None of them are there anymore. (laughs) But uh, the card was a six-match card. Keith Lee defeated Dominic Dijakovic. Uh, Dakota Kai defeated Tegan Knox in a street fight. Uh, Finn Balor defeated Johnny Gargano. Rhea Ripley defeated Bianca Belair for the women's championship or defended the women's championship. The Bruiser Weights, the Broser Weights, I'm sorry, uh, Matt Riddle and Pete Dunne defeated the Undisputed Era's Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly um, in a tag team championship match. So they won the titles. And Adam Cole defeated Tommaso Ciampa to win the NXT championship. Uh, this main event was 33 minutes, 33 by God minutes and 20 minutes. For, oh, hellacious 20 minutes for Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic. Oh, God, yes, they peaked. This was full indie black and gold NXT. I mean, you could do no more than this. Everything peaked at TakeOver Portland. And in, in February of 2020, we came out of that show, and this is all the talent included, and we all went, that's as, as good as it's ever going to we, we What more can we do? How many more... How much more can we do? We've got to figure something a little bit different out. The quality is that good, and it's, we've done so many sh- How can we change this? And while we were all trying to put our heads around that, that's including all the top talent and everybody there, three weeks later, COVID it. And we just went into survival mode, which everybody did. And I think I'll leave it up to what I, you, you can have your own versions of what happened I think it was it was all happened at the, uh, the, uh, in the same uh, time frames are a bit off for me because I had a very strange 2018. So my memories there's a you know there was a lot of 2018 and early 2019 I wasn't around. But it all seemed to happen. AW came along, which you knew anybody young and is is a, is a different product with a different group of people. And I think because. What we were doing in NXT wasn't translating onto the main roster. All right. So AEW comes in. They're doing the same thing NXT does, except for they're actually doing it with people uh, AEW wants to push. So this is uh, one of my old things that uh, AEW basically moved into NXT's territory and basically took over the NXT spot. But it was... It wasn't a developmental or a third brand. It was the main show with all of the resources of a main show. So they were pushing smaller guys and wasn't as much of a focus on um, star power as much as it was just, are you a good wrestler? If you're a good wrestler, then, you know, you can get a push. I will put it that way. And I think some of the fan base were getting sick of, their people that they were getting behind in NXT not getting to where they thought they should do on the main roster. All right, so clearly this is one of those things where fans were being deterred because they see Shinsuke Nakamura or Robert Roode or whatever 
not instantly becoming WWE champion. So they get frustrated and they run off to AEW. It's about as easy a way as I can say that. I think it all came along at the same time. And people were getting a bit... And, and a new product came along. And anything new is different. And with people that you've, you've, you only see if you can hunt out certain things. And it was all exciting. No different than NXT became all exciting. Right? It was something that... And, and then we went into survival mode. And so all these things changed. And... I was quite happy to take a year off. Once I, there was a particular person who's no longer there now, so it, it's not, and certainly not the boss. Because I, can, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it was nothing to do with him why I'm not there. And he looked after me very, very well on the way out. All right, so he's talking about, um, I'm guessing John Laurinaitis. So this is probably around the time Triple H uh, has to take his leave. You know, um, where NXT got blown up and John Laurinaitis came down there. And, of course, he says the boss means Vince, so. And uh, told me a few things that I can't tell you, but just basically people have to make their own mistakes, Darren. So, but I knew it. And I was, okay, I'll, I'll just go. I'll just go for a while. And I'm going to take a year off because I never got a chance to catch up or really recover from all the stuff that went on with me in 2018, which was a lot, including two bleeds on the brain, um, which now and then causes me to ramble sometimes, as you probably noticed, but also, you know, I, I didn't know how long I was going to be able to do this. Um, and I'm fine now, but, and heart, major art things and whatever, but I'm fine. I'm, never been. I wish I'd have felt like this when I was wrestling. Christ. Honestly, I wish I'd have felt this good for so many years when I was wrestling, but I'm all right now. And somehow I've got through it. So I was happy to take a year off and then Brian called me. And... All right, so you can see as he was saying, he's kind of, you know, rumbling there a little bit. Um, he was going to take a year off anyway. So... A lot of people feel like he was dead wrong, but from what it sounds like, it sounds like he was going to leave anyway. You know, NXT had peaked, you know, the pandemic had happened. Uh, AEW made their appearance. They made their stuff well known. So now things have to change in NXT. And William Regal is one of the things that probably needs to change. So he decides he's going to take himself a year off, and now he's getting a phone call from Brian Danielson. So now that means, of course, we're going to go into the AEW stuff, but we don't really need to get into that, do we? So I'll skip the head a little bit. But I went there, and Brian, well, I think you can help out. I said, no, I just want to be talent. Maybe I can help out in, in the long run, but I've just done... When you put so much of yourself, and the last couple of years in COVID trying to keep everybody okay, right? Because so many people from, we had a crew of people over here that we had for five months on lockdown. So, it, oh, so he says over here, he means England because he's in England because that's where Inside the Ropes is based. Instead of sitting idle, we were doing, watching matches and breaking them down six, six hours a day, five days a week. I was doing that on Zoom calls with the UK crew. We, nobody was sat doing nothing, looking after every, trying to do things with everybody, right? And all the talent in NXT that were all from different countries, they, they were no different, and the same with me. I've got realities, I can't, you know, I had two aunties die in COVID, I couldn't come over here. I, my dad is, is 88, I couldn't come and see him. And there's just realities, right? And I was like, I just want a year off, I, I need to just rest. I knew it's coming because the person you've sent to, to try to look over us, um, I think is an idiot. And I'm telling him to his face that he's an idiot over and over again. And he can't have that. And I, I understood that. I understood that because nobody knew when Triple H, if he was ever going to come back. And I didn't know. So I was, understand, it total makes business sense to take me out of the equation. Because everybody there came to, didn't matter what happened, they still come to me. Well, 
they're supposed to go to somebody else. So I knew it was my time was short, and it didn't help with me keep calling him an idiot. All the time. <laughs> no doubt we're talking about John Laurinaitis. But um, this is similar to the other developmental systems where, you know, there's a change in um, talent relations. And then they want to bring their own guys in. So this politics of talent relations, we went through the entire thing with um, the developmental system. Each time would be something different. JR would be in talent relations and he would have his guys that he liked to send people to. And he had his systems that he enjoyed working with. And then Johnny Ace took over and Johnny Ace would uh, have his guys that he wanted to send uh, to the main roster or changing the way that they recruit and uh that sort of thing had an impact so to be quite honest black and gold nxt could be its own episode of wwe developmental because it, it started at a certain point and then it kind of broke off at a certain point before nxt 2.0 started and then nxt 2.0 had its of course starting end with again changes in talent relations from uh triple h's return to um you know, Vince's ouster. So as we can see, uh, Regal is not getting along well with an unnamed man, but the boss of talent relations at the time was probably John Laurinaitis and John Laurinaitis and William Regal not getting along. Well, uh, somebody saying that, uh, the head of talent relations is a fucking idiot. Well, <laughs> you only really hear that when it's John Laurinaitis, even when it was, you know, when Bruce was kind of helping out with the, developmental stuff i don't think anybody ever said that bruce was an idiot <laughs> you know but um things are changing down there in nxt so this is all this stuff that um we've talked about already before you know it's stuff that we've discussed it's not anything out of the ordinary uh but i come out and i go and i said look just i just want to be town and then brian said no, we're just going to do this with me. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. And then you do this with, with John. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's about as much as I can tell you because I haven't... I, I get there at 10 o'clock in the morning and I'm training with people who want to train because I don't... I make the most of my day or two days a week there, but I'm talent. I just happen, as I've always done, how I ended up with a job that I've just had, I was always by the ring. I'm never sitting around doing something because if it wasn't for people I've mentioned who helped me when I was younger, I wouldn't be here. I don't play cards. I don't do gossip. I don't talk. I've got no conversation with anybody about sports. So I never, I don't sit in the dressing rooms with everybody. I go out to the ring and I'm either training myself, like do my own exercises or people would come along. And that's gone for years. That was 20 years of me being in WWE that year. Well, 11 or whatever it was till I moved full time to NXT. So I've all, I always did that. And so I just want to be talent. And maybe after a month, then maybe ask me and I can do things. Well, once I got there, I thought, well, they've got everything sorted out. That for me, I, I don't have to think about anything. I, I don't give it the slip. William Regal now is just back to being, when I started as Lord Stephen Regal, it was, how can I be a carry-on character so everybody in Britain gets the act but people over in America will hate me. <laughs> All right. So he basically explained his role in AEW. He was just talent. And that was it. So that's essentially the important part of the of the interview. Is that he talked about, you know, his last couple of months in NXT. He felt like things peaked. There was a need for change. Uh, that change happened when Triple H went down with his heart issue. And that was like... Hey, it was a really fortuitous occasion that they felt like they peaked anyway. Uh, AEW appears to start kicking their ass in the ratings. Uh, Triple H goes down. Vince sends John Laurinaitis down there to fix it. John Laurinaitis, as far as I'm concerned, he didn't do too bad because we got NXT 2.0 where things got fun again. Um, but there's a larger, more vibrant i guess you could say uh section of the wrestling me uh, media and the wrestling fandom that is all all we want is 30 minute matches 
who cares if the guy doesn't have any personality or any charisma or any persona or anything. And some, for somebody like me, that, that doesn't work. But for them, it worked. And I was complaining again. This is not just a bandwagon I jumped on. If you're new to this channel, you got into the channel within the last year or so, last six months, you can go back. I was complaining about NXT probably, uh, what was it? Uh, it was it was a time in NXT, the black and gold era, where it just felt like it was either Finn Balor, Ciampa, Gargano, or Cole. And it was just like this and vortex that they were just stuck in. I was just kind of like, please break this up. And then they did that fatal four-way match. It was a fatal four-way match that they did. I think it was an a Iron Man fatal four-way match or something silly like that. And it pissed me off so badly that I think I shit on NXT from that day forward until 2.0 started. And if you're a longtime listener of this channel, you know that I probably got upset with NXT before that match happened. But I can remember specifically being very upset when that match occurred. So this is not some, you know, new booty thing that I've been I've been on. I knew NXT was getting boring. It sucked. And despite and, and everybody was saying that it sucked. A lot of your favorite podcasters were, were not even reviewing NXT anymore because they didn't care or the ratings were too low or they couldn't get um they couldn't get any views on the reviews. There was people, I think Russell, was it Russell Talk or was it Russell View or somebody, not Russell View, but like, um, it was some Voices of Wrestling or something that stopped doing NXT reviews. While they were still head to head with Dynamite, they stopped doing NXT reviews. Fucking Jim Cornette stopped doing NXT reviews. They stopped caring about the product. And then when NXT 2.0 happened, they started watching it again because they were like, oh, look what they did to our beloved NXT. It's like, you just said it sucked. Every week you were saying that it sucked. And then as soon as NXT crawls itself out of the doldrums again, because, you know, the ratings tanked when they moved to Tuesdays. And NXT 2.0 scratched and clawed its way back up to some semblance of what the ratings were prior to the, the tank, the move to Tuesday, the the blowing up of NXT and the revamp of it. It started kind of climbing itself back up. Vince got ousted. And now we're back to work rate NXT. And all of the cool characters are gone. And now we're, they're dumping a bunch of Europeans all over us. So I don't hate the Europeans, but it's just, is it is what it is. All right, enough of this. Let's finally get into the, the episode of NXT. Hey, so uh, NXT, big, big issue, what <laughs> issue, big episode of NXT, the a new women's champion. <laughs> and uh, people are, it's a mixed reaction, mixed. We'll get to it. In fact, we'll get to it imminently. Roxanne Perez is in the ring. Um, she's about to talk about how great it feels to be the Iron Survivor. When she's interrupted by Grayson Waller, who is caterwauling about being the first men's Iron Survivor. And uh, all the great things he was doing, like doing shoeies with celebrities and all this kind of stuff. Then said that uh, Roxanne Perez wasn't beating Mandy, so her winning was for naught. Uh, Brian Breaker came out there, said that uh, nobody cares what he thinks well, nobody cares what Grayson Waller thinks. Roxanne is a future champion. Uh, they, they go back and forth a little bit more before Brian decided to hop the barricade and chase Grayson Waller out of the building. This would be the last time you would see these two tonight. That You would not see these guys again. Uh, Mandy Rose then jumped Roxanne from Perez behind, from behind, hit her with the championship belt, and uh, then Roxanne got up and promptly said that she wanted her title match tonight. So, uh, Mandy Rose gave it to her, gave her a title match on this show. Now, you might be wondering, what was Toxic Attraction? It says Mandy lost the belt. Well, you know, did they get run over by trucks or something like that? Because, you know, for the last year, you couldn't keep Toxic Attraction away from that damn ring. But, nope, they had a match earlier in the evening. It was Toxic Attraction versus... Uh, Tatum Paxley and Ivy Nile. Now, uh, KC Squared came out there to watch and do commentary. 
as they do, WWE loves their tropes. Uh, people go over the desk, land into the laps of the commentary team, and they literally just did this on Raw. Uh, Toxic Attraction gets in the face of KC Squared. They get punched. So it's, this match is thrown out, um, and it's a disqualification, or a double DQ, or whatever the case. Toxic Attraction won, but they won by disqualification, apparently. There's a big brawl between the three teams. Later on that night, the brawl continues. So Toxic Attraction is not around at all. When Mandy wrestles Roxanne Perez. Again, they have tried to lock Toxic Attraction in haunted houses. They have tried to run them over with cars. They have tried to beat them with chairs. They have tried everything over the past year to get rid of Toxic Attraction. It has not been able to do it. But tonight, because they got into a fight, they were fighting for an hour and a half and missed this entire match. Roxanne Perez was able to get a fair one, a fair shot against Mandy Rose, and she won. This was one of the best performances I've seen Mandy Rose put on. She legitimately looked good out there. She did a cartwheel drop kick that was pretty sweet. Her um, forearm shivers, they, they looked like shit because they're a girl, but at least she was aggressive. Um, she kicked out, well, Mandy Rose hit her finish clean. Uh, Roxanne Perez kicked out of it. But then, uh, shortly thereafter, Roxanne Perez hit her own finish and won the match, and thus the championship. So Roxanne Perez is the youngest NXT Women's Champion of all time, probably the youngest NXT Champion, period, of all time. Booker T is excited. He's yelling, we did it on commentary. We did it. We did it. Um, we did it, man. Shuggy Duggy. And, uh... Mandy, of course, was not happy, but it was people were having a difficult time deciding whether Mandy was unhappy because, well, she's supposed to be. She is the champion. Now she's the former champion. Or if she's unhappy because she lost the title after people supposedly found her OnlyFans page. And that was the split decision. Just about everybody likes Ma Roxanne Perez. You know, I'm saying she's bland as toast. But I kind of called that she was going to be the one who was going to beat Mandy Rose. I mean, the girl was a champion when WWE signed her. She was the Ring of Honor Women's Champion. So it was only a, a matter of time before they actually gave her the NXT title. Um, but the situation that surrounds it is very interesting. So apparently over the weekend, shortly before or after deadline... Uh, some of these obsessive stands had stumbled upon upon Mandy Rose's OnlyFans account, and the tons of her content were leaked online. Um, I I did not see a link to the OnlyFans account, <clears throat> but because you know removing OnlyFans content and uh, downloading it and stuff like that, I think it's illegal. I think it's theft technically or whatever. But um, somebody leaked it. The stuff was all over the place, um, and. They kind of rushed the title switch. Now, apparently they were going to do the, the title switch at New Year's Evil, which was going to be next month. So it was about um, another four, five weeks, maybe. Um, it was supposed to be in late, mid-January. So like January 10th or something like that. And uh, that's when the match was supposed to be. Instead, they moved the match up to this week and took the belt from her. And in a very anticlimactic way, in where she loses on a random episode of NXT in a match that was not built up at all outside of the attack earlier in the night. And then there was the no toxic attraction, not even attempting to interfere in this match. It all, all the signs are pointing at this is more of a punishment more than a natural story element. Similar to when, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden Oscar has a new championship after Paige, uh, defiled the previous one. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting time, you know, for wrestling where you have these women's champions, these women title holders in general, um, doing things outside of the ring. That uh, leads to them having titles taken away. Now, we've seen it with the men. You know, Rob Van Dam, most famously, got busted for marijuana and had to drop his titles on an episode of Monday Night Raw. Then he lost his uh, ECW title the very next night. You know, everybody knew it was a punishment. 
that she was going, he was being suspended, but they, you know, took the titles from him. Uh, similarly, I'm guessing this was the same thing. Uh, the only fans account, I'm not sure if it was in violation of WWE policy, um, but it seemed like it would be. Uh, some of the material was nude, if I remember correctly. It, it wasn't like full frontal porn or anything like that. Um, but some of the stuff was pretty risque. Um, you could probably find some of the leaks online if you want it. And uh, I could see that, you know, WWE might want to distance themselves from that. I can understand it. You know, this would be... It, it's not quite unprecedented because Alina Vega was fired for having an OnlyFans account. And she didn't post porn at all. It was more just her in different costumes. She was doing cosplay. Uh, Mandy's a little bit more risque. There was a lot of lingerie and bikini stuff. But there's also some her barely covering her nipples and that sort of thing. Uh, apparently, this was a secret. I don't know how it was a secret, even though some people, again, like I said, some people knew about it weeks ago. When I looked it up, because you know I looked it up, come on. Um, there was a guy who did a video saying that he paid for the account weeks ago, but he blurred all the images. So there are people who knew it existed. And then over the weekend, somebody decided they were going to make it public that they knew about Mandy Rose's OnlyFans account. And then... Out of nowhere, they made the lightning quick decision that on the first NXT, they get the opportunity to, they took the time, they took the belt from her. And uh, so now Mandy Rose has gone from being one of the most hated and, uh, oh, it's beyond time for her to lose the belt to all the simps coming out saying, oh, poor Mandy. You know, she's only losing the title now because somebody out at her OnlyFans account. And you know what? I can't deny it. It is kind of BS. You know, it's kind of be. But you know, policy is policy. She, if she knew she wasn't supposed to be doing OnlyFans or whatever, and she did it anyway, that was a risk she took. Um, and from my understanding, she was getting tipped quite a bit in uh, these little OnlyFans things. And one of them, she asked if people wanted to tip her four hundred bucks. So that means she might have been making quite a grip off this whole thing. And so the company kind of had to make a move on it. And, um, do I feel bad for her? No, <laughs> I really don't. Women live life on easy mode. You know, this whole, I could just take my top off and simps will just give me tons of money. Look, just take the money then, you know, give up the belt and take the simp bucks and just do your thing. You know, you know it's against company policy when you do it. You're an adult. She's in, I think she's like 30 or something like that. She can do whatever she wants. The company just don't want their their stuff involved with her stuff. So she has to give them their stuff back. So, okay, cool. They She coughed the title up, you know, to Roxanne Perez. And maybe what was going to be a longer running story is not going to be a truncated story. Uh, now... That being said, they still could have a match at New Year's Evil. It could just be the rematch um, where Roxanne, instead of winning the title at New Year's Evil, she's instead defending the title at New Year's Evil. But <laughs> that's a tough cookie. And there are some people who are legitimately sympathetic. That's what simp is for. Sympathetic to uh, Mandy Rose's plight. And while I understand why you would be sympathetic to it, I am, however, not. And I'm not, you know, just you know, king dingling of the heart on hose situation. I just understand business. You know, it's got it what's fair is fair. You know, Zelina Vega got in trouble for having an OnlyFans account. So Mandy should get in trouble for having an only OnlyFans account. I know that, you know, you wanted to make some extra bucks or whatever. Maybe the NXT bucks ain't enough. <laughs> whatever. I don't know what the situation is and I don't care. I know she has some other entrepreneurial uh, things going on. Um, she, I think her and uh, Sonya might have a business. They have a donut shop or something like that. WWE is not involved with that. They can't do anything about that. But that OnlyFans thing is, is a little bit different. You know, and the fact that it was a secret, I think, was an even bigger deal. So, uh, 
Uh, let me know what you think about that. What do you think about uh, Mandy Rose being punished for having an OnlyFans account? Especially considering her, you know, it's she's living her gimmick. The whole toxic attraction thing is based off of her look. So this is kind of where you kind of get the uh, the sex positive feminism on it. Like, okay, WWE can monetize how Mandy Rose looks, but Mandy can't do it on her own. That's a question that you could ask. It's a legitimate question. You know, Mandy Rose wants to go out and do sexy pictures or sexy videos where she's twerking without without underwear on or something like that. And she wants to make extra bucks doing that. Why did WWE get to stand in the way of that? It's a legitimate question. You know, um, but I understand it. But I also understand it from a corporate position where they're already pushing the envelope to a degree with toxic attraction. And heavens to Betsy, do you remember all the nerds and dweebs who were saying that NXT was basically porn because somebody kissed on the show? And because the toxic attraction was wearing, they were wearing lingerie to the ring. Oh my God. And then you find out Mandy is kind of doing, going even further than that on her OnlyFans account. And now people are kind of like, well, she can do her own thing. You know, so it's hypocrisy all the way around. There's no baby faces in this situation. It's just about, you know, personal feeling. Personally, how do you feel about Mandy Rose having an OnlyFans account? I'm I'm against OnlyFans in general. You know, I'm not saying that it should be outlawed. I'm not going to go Kanye West on, on everybody saying that we need to live in a good Christian nation. So ban OnlyFans. I'm just going to tell people you have to be careful with the, the the society that you're creating when you incentivize stuff like OnlyFans culture, you know, and it's a thing where almost all the female wrestlers are doing it. If somebody like Allison K can make money off of OnlyFans, for Christ's sake, Zelina Vegas missing out on so much money. If, if <laughs> I'm telling you, if, you know, human dump trucks like fucking Jordan Grace has an OnlyFans account and she's making money off that thing for Christ's sake imagine how much some of these chicks in WWE could be making on OnlyFans imagine how much an Alexa Bliss OnlyFans or a Liv Morgan OnlyFans could really draw in just imagine it because there's chicks out here who are just wrestlers and they look like plain Janes and sometimes they just wear lingerie sometimes and they be raking in the bucks on OnlyFans. And you got these chicks who are on TV two, two, three times a week with huge fan bases, 300, 400, 500,000 followers, a million followers on Twitter. But at the same time, WWE is a PG product and OnlyFans tends to have a very negative, almost Pornhub reputation. So there's a lot to consider. So but when you tell me what you think about the Mandy Rose thing, I want you to take into account everything, not just your personal opinion and your personal religious preference or your personal political preference. But how do you square a PG company being OK with their performers doing OnlyFans, which might not be PG? In Mandy Rose's case, however, it does further her gimmick because it kind of continues the whole toxic attraction thing. But. It's something to consider. And I know we'll be having this conversation probably in a real video at some point. And, you know, I probably went a little bit deeper in it than I should have for um, a review. But whatever. The big up to Roxanne. I called it. I knew she was going to be the one. Now, hopefully they can find a character or a persona for her. But something tells me that uh, they're not going to. <laughs> they're not going to. All right. Wesley got jumped by Stax with Tony D'Angelo with barking orders at him. This led to Stax versus Wesley. Wesley defeats Stax, of course. Uh, Dijak confronted Wesley post-match, which was just a distraction so Tony D'Angelo could jump her from behind. All right. We're continuing this three-man feud here. Um, I don't know why. Dijak sucks. Wesley sucks. Tony D'Angelo deserves better, but I mean... We're just doing something else right now. We're doing other things right now. All right, so Fallon Henley, uh, her family and her family's bar. The bar is in financial trouble. Uh, Brooks Jens and Jensen, or Briggs and Jensen, I'm sorry, they want to help, but they're also trying to be optimistic, looking forward to 2023, and they're trying to get her to look forward to 2023 too, but the bar is in trouble. 
And uh, times is hard out there on the, um, I don't know, the entrepreneurs. They're not exactly farmers, you know, but um, <laughs> times are tough. So um, Brooks and Jensen, they uh, get a tag team title shot next week via the New Day because they did the Pledge of Allegiance, believe it or not. New Day came out there to celebrate winning tag team championships and in, uh, in doing so. Uh, the New Day put over Kofi Kingston. Well, as Avery Woods put over Kofi Kingston, being the first ever singles and tag team triple crown winner, uh, and having most tag team championship reigns than anybody else. Booker T was on was on commentary denying this, of course, saying he had sixteen. He did the math. Uh, <laughs> Kofi acknowledged that Booker T is going to have an attitude about this, and of course he does. Um. Xavier Woods explained how he was in NXT. He was in the first NXT match 10 years ago against Big E. That got a Big E chant. Uh, says he was the first graduate of the PC to go to Monday Night Raw, but he never got a chance to be a champion in NXT. And uh, he's glad he's able to fulfill that now. Pretty Deadly came out there, claimed that New Day soon ruined Christmas, wanted a rematch. Uh, Kofi said that Pretty Deadly are talented, but wanted them to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in order to get a rematch. Brooks and Jensen came out there, recited the Pledge of Allegiance, and New Day said that they would consider giving them the Tag Team Championship match because they did what New Day asked, which is to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Kiana James uh, then met Brooks Jensen while he was backstage. Now, this is their kind of continuing the thing from Deadline where Kiana James wanted Brooks to actually wear clothes that fit and for him not to like such a bum. So, she had her friend her associate, her assistant, go out and purchase Brooks Jensen a new shirt and told him that if he's going to be a champion, he needs to look like one. Uh, Brooks Jensen was mulling over how to help Fallon Henley and was trying to keep that to himself. But once Keanu James gave him that shirt, he blurted out that, oh, the bar is having such troubles and yada, yada, yada. I'm just trying to help. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that. And um, gave him this shirt. So it's pretty clear that now Keanu James, who is known for her money, is going to try to buy the bar or be the proprietor of the bar. It'll be fun. It ought to be very fun uh, to have Keanu James and Fallon Henley fighting over this bar. And for it to be uh, uh, Brooks or the, yeah, Brooks, no, Jensen. Jen, or oh, Brooks is Jensen's shit. Anyway, where the fuck this kid is, man? Uh, for him, who uh, seems to be the guy that they've been playing with in, in terms of the guy who um, Fallon Henley is going to become friends with and maybe even a little bit mo, that he's going to be the one who's going to do all the, be super talkative and put the situation in Keanu James' head. But um, it's very suspicious anyway, isn't it? Keanu James wanted to buy the bar. They said no. Now all of a sudden the bar is in financial trouble. And now she's going to pop up and probably offer a loan or something. Ought to all be very coincidental, much like a soap opera, wouldn't it? Um, I don't like Brooks Jen and Jensen. Well, Brook Briggs and Jensen, they both suck. But I did like that Keanu James is manipulating him. You know, if you're going to be a champion, you need to look like one. And bought him a fitted shirt. <laughs> she's gonna she's gonna start dressing this guy now, turn him into the man she wants. I guess that ought to be fun. Women do that, especially bossy women. Uh, Trick and Mello, they were backstage. Mello was kind of humble, dare I say, because the streets are saying that Mello missed. And Mello's like, uh-uh, I ain't miss. I might have lost. But I ain't miss. Well, he said, I didn't win. He didn't say he lost. He said, I didn't win, but I didn't miss. So then Trick Williams says that, uh-uh, Axiom is posterizing you on Twitter with this picture of him doing a flip off the, the uh, what was that? The shark cage, um, the penalty box, onto Mello. And Mello was like, uh-uh, we can't go out like this. I'm about to go handle that. I want to have a match with Axiom. So he went to go challenge Axiom to a match. Axiom would respond later by, with sarcasm about how he has no fear from anybody. And they'll wrestle next week. That ought to be, that ought to be very nice. Good for Axiom. He's going to get to rub elbows with him. And that ought to be very nice. Um, 
I'm wondering how long uh, Carmelo Hayes is, is going to hang around in NXT. Trick Williams also had a match on main events by himself. I think he wrestled Cedric Alexander. Um, I don't. I didn't. I didn't hear that he blew anybody away. Like he was that impressive. But I also didn't hear that he was the shits. So, um, it's going to be interesting. You know, are they going to bring them up together? Which they should, and they kind of have to. But um, he was on main event by himself. All right. So, third match. Von Wagner was defeated by Odyssey Jones. This was only notable because Vic Joseph hilariously called Robert Stone a bum-ass James Bond on commentary, which was excellent and reminds me why I love Vic Joseph. And Vic Joseph is easily the best commentator in WWE currently. And anybody who disagrees, need to think again. Think twice, please. I, I beg you to reconsider. Also, if you don't like Big Body Javi, you should read it, reconsider. Uh, Javier Bernal is backstage with Mackenzie Mitchell. And uh, I know the name of the microphone holder, at least for now. Uh, she's rooting for Ike Jiro to defeat Javier Bernal, and he doesn't like that. But he's been sitting around really putting some thought into what he should name his fans. So he says he had to go and get ready because he wants to give a great performance for the Big Body Bandits. She's like, huh? Then he changed it to the Big Body Ballers. And then she says that he's not a baller. So then she <laughs> he switches it to the Big Body Bulldogs. And she says, like the Georgia Bulldogs? And he then he switches it again to the Big Body Believers. And that one sticks because she ain't got no response to that one. So Big Body Believers it is. So Big Body Javi absolutely rules. He has a match against Ike Jiro where he got a lot of heat just for being himself. Uh, <laughs> Jiro literally did nothing to earn the cheers. It was just Javi Urban all being a dickhead. He's very good. Um, Booker T is on the fence about Big Body Javi and Vic Joseph got on his case about it. Um, big, body, big body Javi on his way to join the Booker T's Fade Five. You know, it's 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 upcoming. Um, I came in Jero wins the match, which surprised the hell out of me because I'm like, why did that happen? Um, I came in Jero ain't been on TV in like two months, and now all of a sudden he beat Javier Bernal. Um, okay, then Scripps came out of nowhere and jumped. I came in Jero beat him up and stole one of his uh his silly jackets. And then hit him with a whoopee cushion, the flipping whoopee cushion move. Um, I mean, Scripps couldn't look more ridiculous. He still looks ridiculous with that loose ass mask. They're still trying to make it more serious, but you know him feuding with Ike Minjiro, I don't understand why. I promise you, I swear to God, I don't understand why him and Ike Minjiro are feuding. It doesn't make sense to me. I guess it, it had to be figured out. Scripps is supposed to be like this terrorist or something. I don't know. He's supposed to be trying to destroy NXT. So you start with Ike Jiro? Is Ike Jiro like the, the piece on the Jenga board that if you move it, everything collapses? I don't know. What the fuck? Why do I care about Ike Jiro? He ain't been on TV in weeks. Ugh. And Javier Bernal should have won. Moving on. Wendy Chu gave us this sad story. I don't know what's going on with NXT, man. Um, it's coming across like MTV story, storytelling. Wendy, Wendy Chu claims she, she cried when Cora Jade threw the drink in her face because it reminded her of a slumber party when she was a child and somebody threw a drink at her and she didn't have a change of clothes and how she was mocked and humiliated. And she never wanted to feel that way again. And I just was like, what the fuck? Who is okay in these stories? That is an adult human being. And we're talking about childhood trauma of being embarrassed. Like, what next? It's going to be like, it's, about, it's like that time when Johnny pulled my hair. He put a booger on my shirt. <sighs> it's like they're going, yeah, these motherfuckers in NXT are going fishing. They're doing OnlyFans. They're giving each other COVID. It's just all kind of stuff going on in it. What the fuck? Now we got to go through all the childhood traumas and picadillos. What on? Earth man, god damn, god damn, how about not wearing pajamas? <laughs> That's just gonna, if, if you know getting wet while you're wearing pajamas is gonna trigger you to have a mental breakdown. How about not walking around in pajamas all goddamn day? Because at any given time, you're gonna spill coffee on yourself, water gonna drip, and then all of a sudden, you're gonna fold like a lawn chair every time you get wet and wearing pajamas. Get the fuck out of here. 
Oh, NXT. Come on, man. Just do better than this, please. <laughs> please do better than this. Uh, I know everybody who's like, oh my God, the Attitude Era was so dumb. Edge and Booker T was fighting over shampoo. It's like, yeah, but now people are fighting over their childhood traumas that the other person couldn't have possibly known. How the fuck Corey J is supposed to know that you was going to get triggered because she threw some goddamn juice in your face? And then why you start throwing juice in the face of other people if that's what triggers you? Jesus. This is so dumb. Moving on. J.D. McDonough defeated Brutus Creed. Match was okay. Uh, Indu Cher saved Brutus Creed when uh, J.D. McDonough was about to hit him with a chair because, of course, he wants them. They want um, the Creed brothers to be 100% when they have their match. Um, Last Legend was on the screen. First time in a long time. She was with this young lady named Jakara Jackson, who seems to be, this was her debut, as last I checked, her NXT debut. They were backstage with Electra Lopez absolutely hating on Indy Hartwell. It was just hating. It was a hate circle on Indy Hartwell. And then Indy Hartwell jumped to Electra Lopez. Like, question is, why is Electra Lopez back in NXT and we're not doing anything with her? She's just sitting back gossiping about Indy Hartwell. That's not cool. She should be doing cool shit, you know? Do cool shit. I don't, I don't know what's going on, man. I'm at a loss here. Zoe Stark is backstage being old. She then said that she's tired of talking about Nikita Lyons. She didn't want to wrestle Nikita Lyons. Because Nikita Lyons is a clout chaser and a waste of roster space. But if she wants to bring all her TikTok dancing, she will be the real talent and beat up Nikita Lyons. And I said, man, I'm not liking this positioning. Nikita Lyons is being some sort of social media phenomenon with zero ability to back it up that sucks all right and it flies in the face of the the groundwork that you've already done with her character and her persona and she's much fucking bigger than zoe stark like we started this whole thing talking about not just her music career but also how she did martial arts and that's like a lot of the stuff that she does on tiktok and stuff like that is and instagram is her doing martial arts like, you know, nunchucks and, you know, working the heavy bag and stuff like that. To to have fucking Zoe Stark be like, oh, she's just a TikTok dancer. It's like, okay, that works as a heel. But when the audience hasn't seen the Keto Lions do any of that, you know, judo shit that she's known for doing or that she can do, it it kind of eats away at her credibility, you know? We got to show her that, uh, we got to show Zoe Stark that she can do a little bit more than that. And <clears throat> I get it. I get what they're doing though. They're trying to use Nikita Lyons popularity to have, to get Zoe Stark over. It, it won't work because Zoe Stark has almost no charisma, but it's worth an effort. I guess, I guess she, look, Nikita Lyons got the feud with somebody for fuck's sake. I mean, you can't just do the song and dance where she just beats everybody. Anyway, Isla Dawn. She's back there talking about the the power of the black mist and how the, the darkness of the night is going to consume Alma Fire. I thought it already has, but apparently Alma Fire isn't fully consumed yet. So, uh, cons- <laughs> consummation pending. Uh, Amari Miller made an appearance on this show for the first time in a long time, and she had a match against Val- uh, Lyra Valkyria. Lyra Valkyria is making her NXT debut, and she looked great. Her strikes particularly looked very good, and she won the match with a frog splash. Not sure how I feel about the frog splash finish, because so many people have the frog splash finish. And um, don't necessarily love that idea. But uh, Larry Vicaria is very good. Duke Hudson defeated Damon Kemp. Well, it should have been the other way around. And anyway, uh, earlier in the night, uh, Duke Hudson was shaking hands with Drew Gulak. And Andre Chase was thought he was going to transfer and uh, even Thea Hale started yelling about transfer hall, transfer portal, transfer portal. And uh, Duke Hudson was like, no, I'm, I'm in here. I'm, I bleed red and black. But uh, accepted Andre Chase's apology as Andre Chase apologized for cussing him out last week. Uh, Thea Hale was not ready to wrestle Isla Dawn. But this week they celebrated his victory. But Drew Gulak was still watching this match. Damon Kemp should have won this match in order to further that story with um, Drew Gulak, but maybe him losing is what's going to further the story, hopefully. 
All right, so that seems to be all of NXT. Um, thus, uh, the show was solid. You know, uh, new champion, good stuff. Didn't do much with the NXT title. Didn't do much with the North American title. But um, didn't do much with the tag team titles. But kind of set some uh, set some things up. Could be interesting in the future. Um, but o- overall, I think it was a solid enough show. I didn't hate it. Um, so what did you guys think about all of this stuff? Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace.